Hey guys, Anjanette Russell here coming to you um, from the beautiful playground on the Young Toddler Classroom from the Child Development Lab. Uh, I thought this would be a great place to talk about uh, relationships and attachment um, for Chapter 10. So let's get started. Uh, I think Chapter 10 had a lot of information to cover um, and did it in a little amount of pages, which I was impressed with. Uh, one thing I thought that was interesting in chapter 10 is it talked about the importance of relationships um, with mothers and infants and along with fathers and infants. Uh, one thing that in my personal family from day one, you know, after Rochelle was born, I was like, Josh, you're going to talk to her, you're going to play with her, this is what you're going to do. Um, and then since then we've kind of joked around about, you know, the biggest part of being a dad is just, you know, you got to show up. If you can show up to the game, then you're ready to go. Um, I know when we first brought her home from the hospital, she was like a week old and I was like, here, read her a book, you know, and he sat her in his lap and he was like, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know how to hold her. What's going to happen? You know, um, but he sat there and he read to her and she loved it. And, um, one of her very first favorite books was The Paper Bag Princess that we got uh, at a baby shower and he read that every day, day in, day out. Um, and that was actually the theme of her first birthday because she loved that book so much. So yeah, showing up, being there, playing, interacting. Um, I do remember one time vividly where she, Rochelle was about two months old. She was still little. Um, and he took her and he was holding her and he threw her up and like her head went back and I was like, ah, what are you doing? You can't do that. You know, and after it happened, he was like, oh yeah, maybe that was not such a good idea. And I was like, yeah, that's not what you can do when they're this little, you know, give it a few months. And then, you know, when she has better neck control and support, you can do that. Um, but live and learn, you know, nothing bad happened. He didn't throw her up into the ceiling fan. Everything was okay. Um, but yeah, so just being there, being involved, being active. Um, I think it's really hard for moms and especially uh, single moms to try to have that playful fun time with their newborn children because they're stressed out with trying to you know, feed the baby, take care of what they need to do uh, at home with chores going to work, all that type of stuff. Um, whereas I feel like a lot of times dads can come in and they'll just be like, hey, it's time to wrestle and time to play and all that stuff. Um, the other day, actually, when it was raining at our house, it was a rainy Sunday, and um, Rochelle and Jacob both wrestled with their father for a good 45 minutes, you know, just jumping on him and tackling him. And I'm like, don't get hurt. We cannot go to the hospital, you know. Um, but they had a great time and it's definitely a different type of play than how they play with me. Um, I will tell you with our own personal experience, Jacob is a lot more rough and tumble, whereas Rochelle is just like, oh, hold me and cuddle with me. And Jacob will, you'll be sitting on the sofa reading a book and he'll come and jump up and pull his knees up and like flying squirrel land on you. And he just laughs and giggles and thinks it's the most hilarious thing ever. Um, but yeah, so I thought that was interesting. Uh, another thing that it talked about in chapter 10, uh, it didn't touch on it a whole, whole lot, uh, but the postpartum depression, I know I've talked with you guys about that, how I, I had a really hard time with that after having Jacob, whereas Rochelle, Firstborn, totally fine. Everything was okay. Um, Jacob, you know, after he was born, things were great. Things were fine. Then going back to work, and it was about the second week of going back to work full time um, in January, where I just hit a brick wall, and I was like, I can't do this anymore. I don't know what I'm doing. You know, I felt helpless, even though Josh was there every day, day in, day out to help me. Um, Jacob was doing great as far as breastfeeding and then we transitioned him into real food and he was doing great with that um so it wasn't like one particular thing where i could say oh this was the hard part you know um as we know january the weather is crazy and um with being cold and rainy and that type of thing so not being able to go outside might have had a contributing factor 
um, as I do love being outside, spending time with my family. Um, but yeah, I just was ready to give up and I had planned it and thought about it and how I was going to make videos for Rochelle and telling her how to do her makeup and how to pick out a prom dress. Um, you know, how to pick a decent boyfriend in high school, you know. Um, and I thought about different scenarios as to, okay, I don't want Josh to find me and I don't want the kids to find me. So I would go out into the pasture back behind our house and do it there. But then I'd have to call the police to let them know where to find me because no one would know how to get there. Um, so yeah, I was in a very terrible, dark spot for a good while. And like I said, the thing that finally snapped me out of it was, you know, we were, bought these tickets to go see Eric Church in concert. And I was like, I really love him. Like, I mean, I love my family, obviously a whole lot more. Um, but just having that crazy little motivation of seeing, you know, one of my favorite artists in concert was like, I can't do that. I can't kill myself because I'll miss out on this concert that I've been wanting to see for three months, you know? Um, so yeah, I definitely recommend, you know, if you are ever in a situation like that, please reach out and get help. Please, please, please do not do anything, um, that will have lifelong consequences like that. Okay. So do it for me, do it for your family, uh, do it for Air Church, you know, because without fans, he wouldn't have any albums or concerts to people to go to. Um, so that I think was interesting. Uh, it talked a little bit about sibling relationships and I want to focus more of our talk today about that because I'm an only child. So all this new sibling interaction with Rochelle and Jacob, it's totally new to me, you know. Uh, now she's at home digitally learning like the rest of us. So we'll be on the laptop and she's working on her computer, you know, doing things for school. And Jacob will go into her room and he'll go get this toy and she freaks out because he's playing with one of her toys. I'm like, Rochelle, he's not gonna break it. He's not gonna destroy it. She's like, but I don't want him to touch it. I'm like, it's fine. You're doing your work. He can play with this, you know, and Josh will come home and he'll be like, no, she doesn't want him to touch his, her, her stuff. That's her stuff. This is his stuff. He needs to play with his own stuff. And I'm like, he's tired of his own toys. You know, we've been doing this for right out a month. He's tired of his own toys. He wants to play with her toys. Um, and so it's kind of interesting because my husband, Josh, he's got um, two younger brothers that are really close in age to him. And then he has another little brother that just turned 12. Um, and then he has a sister that he grew up with and they were four years apart and he said his sister would do everything to aggravate the crap out of him and he just got tired of it and he was like Jacob is aggravating Rochelle I'm like but he's not bothering her he and Josh is like I know but he is taking her things that are her toys and I'm like okay um, so I think that has definitely been a learning concept for me um, especially this past month. Uh, like I said the other day, um, and this will be part of our part of your discussion for chapter 10 uh, to do on ELC for the discussion board. So there was a scenario that happened and I want your discussion post to be how would you handle this situation. Um, so I'll give you a little backstory and then you can tell me how you would handle the situation and I'll let you know how I handled it. I don't know how good it went, but this is what happened. So Rochelle's on her scooter, Jacob is on his bike and they're riding around our driveway. So we have a horseshoe shaped driveway that goes like around the back of the house um, and they're just going back and forth, back and forth. Well, Jacob was really uh, upset that Rochelle kept beating him because she's faster, obviously older, better skilled, has longer legs, etc. Um, and I had drawn a start and finish line and it was like the second time around and Jacob was like, she keeps winning. I'm like, that's okay, buddy. And really Rochelle is great about letting him win. Uh, this particular day that did not happen. They'd only raced twice and on the third time around, I was like, all right, on your mark, get set, go. And Rochelle goes and he just sits there and he waits and he looks at me and he's got this look of hate and terror and I'm gonna destroy her look 
in his eye. And I'm like, what are you doing? And he takes off on his bike and he plows into her as she's coming around the curve. She totally is okay. He then wipes out because he's little and didn't know what he was doing. He crashes and I'm just like, really? You're gonna run into your sister and then you're gonna be upset because you crashed. And of course he cried and I went up to him and I told him, I said, Jacob, I have zero sympathy for you, zero. You were maliciously trying to hurt Rochelle you ran into her on purpose hoping that she would not win and then you end up crashing right i said that it's not okay to try to hurt your sister it's not okay to run into her on purpose how can you make her feel better and he just sat there and he cried he was not bleeding um so that's lucky for him i guess we could say um, but yeah, I was just blown away by the situation. So this is the discussion post for you guys. If you saw a child hurt another child like that on purpose, how would you handle that situation? What would you tell the child um, that maliciously and purposely tried to run over the other child, right? What would you tell them? So that is for you guys to write about in your discussion post. Um, like I said, I was blown away that this happened. I told Josh about it and he was like, oh, that's just what siblings do. They're gonna beat each other up. They're gonna fight. And I'm like, but it's not okay. We need to all get along and be happy and sing Kumbaya together. Um, so crazy enough, three days later, we're outside. Rochelle's making this little mud pie thing and um, she's got a shovel and she's digging the dirt and everything and scooping it up and adding water to it And then Jacob's like here. I'll come help you uh, So he goes and he scoops it up and he's carrying the shovel. Well this shovel was Made for an adult to use. Uh, it's got a really long handle So he comes around and whacks Rochelle right here in the forehead with the handle of the shovel He cried for 10 minutes after he did that to Rochelle because he felt so bad. I'm like yes he has a conscience. Things were going to be okay, you know. Um, but I was like, it's okay, Jacob. You didn't mean to. She's fine. Everything's going to be okay. Uh, but yeah, he was crushed that he had hurt her with the handle of the shovel. Right? I'm like, this is coming from the same child that purposely took her out while she was riding her scooter. So, there's hope. Uh, children will continue to improve as long as they're in a loving, caring, functioning, happy relationship. Um, one thing I think that needs to be addressed is the topic of parents and children and interacting together and having conflicts and children seeing those conflicts uh, resolved. I think that is very important. Not to have full-blown arguments in front of children, but for children to see how an appropriate adult discussion goes how things are handled, the flow of communication. Um, I think that's really important for young children to see and observe um, and just to understand adults have problems too. This is how they go about solving those problems. Uh, so I think that's really important. Um, and one thing also, I think it could have talked more about the peer relationships um, that happen like in school settings, church settings, synagogue settings, anytime there's a group of children together what those peer relationships look like. And uh, when I first started teaching uh, two-year-olds, I was at another child care center and the ratio was a little bit higher. We had um, six children to one adult, so it was a little bit, you know, intense. And there was this one child that would always bite the same child every time, every time, every time. Because you know what? You're gonna bite the children that you're around, right? That's who you're gonna hurt the most, is the children that you play with the most. Um, and it just so happened that these boys were best friends, but one would always get bit, you know? And finally, the mother was like, I'm sorry, but I've got to take my child out of here because I'm just tired of him getting bit all the time. I'm like, I totally understand. You know, we're doing everything we can in our power, 
to help stop it. Um, luckily, since then, I've learned a lot, and you know, we handle biting in a very appropriate way uh, at the CDL. Where if the child bites, and it happens a lot in this class that we have now, um, we'll sit them down and tell them stop biting hurts that hurts your friends. Um, and usually within, you know, we'll sit there and talk with them about it and say, look how your friend is crying. They're really upset. And then, you know, after a minute or so, we'll go and we'll try to make the child that got hurt feel better, you know, while another teacher is taking care of that child with giving them an ice pack and giving them love and all that stuff. Um, but yeah, biting, it's going to happen for sure. Uh, and sometimes parents have three to four to five children and one child's a biter and they're like, we don't know what's going on. You know, we're trying to make it better. Um, and it's just really hard, you know, to deal with. And it's not anything that parents are doing wrong. It's not anything that children are doing wrong. It's not anything the teachers are doing wrong. It's just, it's going to happen, you know. Um, so don't freak out if you're ever in that situation and everything. Uh, please let me know if you guys have any questions, concerns about anything. Um, and I hope that helps answer some thoughts you had about chapter 10. All right. Thanks. Have a great day. Bye-bye.